It's almost difficult to believe, but Grand Theft Auto 3 is 20 years old, at least as of the making of this video. This seminal game influenced the entire game industry with its open world design ethos. It stands as one of the first truly successful fully 3D open world sandbox games and its impact can still be felt today. At the time of release, it wasn't even predicted to be a huge deal, but word of mouth rocketed the game to success and it would receive multiple sequels on PlayStation 2 over the years that followed before culminating in what we know today. This fall, however, Rockstar and developer Grove Street Games has just released remastered versions of the three mainline PlayStation 2 era Grand Theft Auto games. And well, let's just say that Grand Theft Auto, the trilogy, the definitive edition, is a strange and interesting beast. There are some good aspects here, no doubt, but by and large, there's a lot of problems as well. There's also a lot to cover, so here's what we're gonna do. We're breaking it down game by game, starting with Grand Theft Auto 3. Keep in mind, if you consider all console versions of each of the three games, including all available graphics modes, we have 39 permutations, not including that PC version. GTA 3 alone has 13 different permutations. So, we're gonna break this down into three sections then. For section one, how does it stack up against the original Grand Theft Auto 3 on PlayStation 2? In this part, we'll primarily focus on answering this question through comparisons with the original release. We're using PlayStation 2 here since it is the original vision of the game. For the next section then, we'll discuss the various console versions available and examine the performance differences between each of them. Do any of the versions run smoothly? What can you expect on your console of choice? Plus, we have a tip on hitting a stable 60 frames per second in exactly one version of the game. Section 3 then will reflect on the various issues and strange design choices we uncovered while playing through. Ultimately, this is a huge topic so we won't cover every change or missing detail, but hopefully this will give you an idea of what to expect. With that said, let's dive in. Yeah, it's fair to say Grand Theft Auto 3 was a big deal when it finally arrived in the fall of 2001. But what about the technology powering the game? As a quick refresher, in its original form, GTA 3 on PlayStation 2 was built using Renderware, a popular middleware solution from Criterion Software that was used in a huge range of games during that generation, including the GTA series. Renderware was as ubiquitous at the time as Unity and Unreal Engine are today. Now, on PlayStation 2, this was not exactly a visual masterpiece at the time. I mean, this was the same year as games such as Metal Gear Solid 2 or Gran Turismo 3, after all. But its scope was incredibly impressive for the time. It features a full time of day system, weather changes, and freeform exploration of Liberty City. Many of these concepts had existed in some form in the original Grand Theft Auto games and titles such as Driver, but this was the first time the player could be unleashed in a completely open-ended 3D environment. You could go anywhere, and that's what made it unique and special for 2001. Since that release, it was ported around to multiple platforms, including the original Xbox and the PC, before ending up on mobile phones 10 years ago. And this is where things start to get tricky. How do you bring such an old game into the modern era? Well, in this case, the developers took a rather unexpected but fascinating direction by rebuilding the mobile port of Grand Theft Auto 3 within Unreal Engine 4. Yes, this is now an Unreal Engine game. Oh, and the developer of this definitive edition is the same developer that produced those mobile ports. Unfortunately, those ports don't have the best reputation. They're known for numerous bugs and gameplay issues, not to mention features that have been stripped out. It's not exactly a great place to start, but here we are anyways. With this in mind, let's begin our comparisons right here during the game's introduction sequence. Immediately, the first thing you'll notice is the shift in art direction. 
the original game has this hazy look, relying heavily on an accumulation style motion blur effect to accentuate the scene, though you can disable this in the options menu if you like. The new game goes for a different tone, it's not inherently bad though, just really different. Once we start to see the character models though, there are some questionable design choices in play. The woman who betrays your character, for instance, has a very different look in the new game, and the scene just feels different in tone as a result. This isn't the first time this character model has been modified though. The Xbox and PC versions also use a different model, which I think kind of looks worse than it does on PlayStation 2 as well, though not as bad as the remastered version. Character models are something we'll be returning to when discussing these updated versions of the game, so keep it in mind. Then there's this newspaper interlude where it seems like they've run AI upscaling on this texture. Again, something else to keep in mind for later. They did, however, replace the main character's portrait with the new model used in the definitive edition. Okay, so this next scene with the prison van. This is where the original developers really lean into the color blending capabilities of the PlayStation 2, enabling smooth representation of light halos all over the place. The scene also has this strong bluish tint, kind of comparable to what we would see in Metal Gear Solid 2, really, and I think it works rather well in this scene. The new version, though, uses this awful rain effect, which is nearly impossible to see through, and as you can see in other areas, it has sorting issues. The transparent water surface in the distance appears in front of the rain particles, leading to these ugly artifacts before you. Okay, there's actually a lot to say about the rain effect, so I have to interject and talk about this before we continue the comparison. I'm sorry, it's just gotta be done. Essentially, you get the impression that there's just this wall of rain attached to your character. It seems like they've attached this blindingly bright rain material to a post-process volume around the player camera and just kinda let it rip. The issue is that the actual texture is too brightly contrasted against the rest of the scene, especially when using HDR where the brightness value is way too high and sort of makes it impossible to see what you're doing. It also has that sorting glitch against bodies of water, leading to a rather glitchy appearance when running around the city. It winds up looking even worse since the rain effect itself is basically just attached to the camera, so it's always falling in this orientation. The effect is so distracting that I think I speak for most people when I say it should probably be patched out. For comparison, here's how the rain looks on PlayStation 2. Honestly, it's not too bad, though it's certainly not the best rain effect we've seen. This was, after all, released very close to Metal Gear Solid 2, which again, still has one of the absolute best looking rain effects I've ever seen. Just look at this. Another thing, while the technique may appear somewhat crude, the road surface becomes increasingly reflective on PlayStation 2. So you actually see things like headlights and street lamps reflect in the surface of the road. The new version has this too, but only in specific versions and only when using certain modes, which we'll get to shortly. And how about that original Xbox version? Well, again, this one actually looks very similar to PlayStation 2 with some slight differences in the way lights and the blur effect manifest. There is a little bit of screen tearing, however, but it does generally run better than it did on PlayStation 2. And yes, of course, it still looks rather different compared to the new remastered version. All right, let's get back to the comparisons here, shall we? As we take off from the introduction sequence, I would say that the updated car models actually aren't too bad in this remake, and the addition of cube map driven reflections are a nice touch. Worth noting that the original Xbox version also received enhanced reflections at the time of its release, though they have been changed and improved in the new version. However, aspects of rendering the vehicles still feel a little off. Firstly, look in front of the vehicle. The way the headlight beam intersects the road surface feels a little bit wrong with visible lines running through it. It never looks quite right. The effect is slightly more pleasing on PlayStation 2, I might argue, despite not being real lights. Of course, thanks to Unreal Engine, the dynamic lights in the world do cast actual shadows now. This includes your headlight beams and even interior dome light when you get into a car, in addition to street lamps and, of course, the sun itself. The PlayStation 2 version is more limited in this capacity with a fixed shadow texture beneath the car, but there are some attempts at simulating the look of dynamic shadows when driving around at night. Check out the shadow from the street lamps and you see what I mean. This actually raises one small caveat with that original Xbox version. 
Street lamps and other dynamic lights exhibit a more boldly transmissive look on PlayStation 2. As you drive under the traffic lights, you'll notice a much deeper green tint on the car as opposed to on Xbox. One thing that is kind of missing though is if you look at the car while driving around at night on PlayStation 2, you'll see a soft red glow around the tail lamps. This is absent in the new version, which almost makes it seem like the headlights of the car are not turned on when they are. At least it does have working brake lights. Just driving around the city though starts to give you a strange impression. On the surface, the new version doesn't necessarily look bad, I might argue. It just loses its sense of style. There's a feeling that many of the decisions made around the presentation in the PlayStation 2 version were extremely deliberate. Not just limitations of the hardware, but actual artistic decisions made within those constraints. The new version instead just seems to utilize a lot of standard Unreal Engine features, which don't necessarily gel with the visual design the game is aiming for. All right, let's continue with our comparison here, starting with the first mission. And it's here that we're introduced to new characters, which brings us to perhaps one of the more controversial changes made to the definitive edition, the character models themselves. So here's the thing, on PlayStation 2, the characters are not super detailed. They had to exist within a much larger world, so the polygon and texture budget was low. In fact, in his original form, Claude uses fewer than 2,000 polygons at most, but his design is still rather distinctive, and it looks pretty good. There's a sense that the artists very carefully utilized what limited resources they did have to great effect. Building nice looking character models with a low polygon count is really an art form. But here's the thing, the PlayStation 2 and PC original versions have rather blocky looking characters, but for the Xbox version, they actually upgraded these models to use a skeleton system. And this includes things such as rendering individual fingers. So they were already improved there, and stylistically, I think they're a close match for the original game, at least in most cases. So what about the new version? In comparison, the characters are a little bit strange. There's a sense that something's just off, and that something becomes clear the deeper you go. Claude, the main character, doesn't look too bad, I suppose, but some of the secondary and tertiary characters have a very bizarre look to them. I believe this comes down to a few things. Firstly, the way the characters are sort of rounded off, they use many more polygons for each character model, but they have this bulbous, almost balloon-like appearance now. And when you combine that with the nature of Unreal's PBR material system, as it interacts with the light, you end up with some rather awkward looking scenes. The specular highlights play off the surface that almost gives the impression that they're made of plastic. The funny thing is though, is that Grand Theft Auto 3 doesn't even seem that bad compared to the worst models evident in the San Andreas remaster, but I don't have to wait for a future video. All right, so let's get back out on the streets and check out some more of the environments here. There are expectedly significant differences in the way the environment itself is rendered. The basic idea here seems to have been to utilize the basic geometric layout of the city, basically the original city model, while replacing the textures with high resolution Unreal compatible materials while adding in new objects where appropriate. The thing is, the combination of these two elements don't always work. There's plenty of texture alignment issues, for instance, like this, or weird combinations of old and new assets like this both of which stand out like a sore thumb. The textures on PlayStation 2 are of course much lower in quality, but they're suitable for the level of geometric detail in this game. This also highlights yet another change with that original Xbox version. This version received enhanced textures already, but like PlayStation 2, they're basic diffuse textures that just kind of work well with the low polygon city model. So it still manages to look pretty good, I'd say. Heck, they even tweaked the geometry in some scenes, adding a little bit of extra detail here and there. In both cases, the assets gel more naturally with the environments. Shoehorning realistic, physically based materials and modern visual effects such as screen space reflections into the world give you this impression of viewing a raw map file through an editor rather than playing it within a game. There's just too much of a style clash for it to really work, I think. Okay, so this is pretty harsh, but there are a few little changes here and there that I do enjoy. The new tree assets, for instance, look great and offer a noticeable improvement over the billboards used on PlayStation 2. I also like the fully real-time shadows, which means as the time of day changes, you'll see the shadow position move along with the sun. 
Now this was not feasible on PlayStation 2 for obvious reasons, and instead you'll see things like tree shadows on the ground that are basically baked into the texture. I also find that the use of screen space ambient occlusion is somewhat distasteful in many areas due to the large flat structures that define the city. You end up with these black outlines around anything near a wall, and it doesn't really look very natural or good. And that's really the thing here. The more you explore, the more you start to feel that things don't quite mesh. The small details are often wrong. I mean, things like AI upscaled sign textures. They look fine in many cases, but in others you'll find things like typos that were missed likely due to the upscaling process. Or something as simple as the scenery just outside the city limits. The distant hills here, they're featureless and empty on PlayStation 2, but in the new version, they almost look like data from Google Earth that hasn't fully loaded in yet. Technically, it's more detailed, but it doesn't actually look better to the eye in practice. Honestly though, I'm really just scratching the surface here. You could probably spend days combing over every inch of this game and finding crazy examples or strange things that look out of place. I suspect there'll be a lot of other people on YouTube making videos about this for many years to come. At the same time, I don't feel that all of the results are completely bad either. Yes, as I said, it falls short stylistically, but it can still look pretty okay at certain times of the day. It's just not what you would expect from a remaster from one of the most successful game series of all time. But okay, let's say you've seen this comparison and you've decided you like the way it looks, or at least you don't mind it. Which version do you want to play? I mean, after all, some of these things could be quite forgivable if it were technically in great shape, but that's where our next section comes into play. Grand Theft Auto, the trilogy, the definitive edition, has been developed for basically every viable platform under the sun. That means we have both current and last generation PlayStation and Xbox consoles, as well as the Nintendo Switch, and the PC, though that version is currently unavailable. When I first jumped at the chance to make this video, I naively assumed that it would be a relatively simple comparison across every machine. I was wrong. Warning, the performance data featured in this section should not be taken orally or used to draw conclusions regarding the performance of your preferred device. Okay, so there's a lot of differences to discuss here, so to make this easier to digest, let's group the various machines together. We'll start by examining the visuals and performance of PlayStation 5 and the two new Xbox consoles. We'll then follow this up by going all the way to the bottom with the Switch version, then round out this section with each of the last generation machines. Okay, so current gen. These three consoles represent the most feature-rich version of the game available. All three offer both a fidelity mode and a performance mode, which is a little bit weird for a game that looks like this to begin with. The default is fidelity. The difference, fidelity mode is capped at 30 frames per second and features a few visual improvements in certain versions at least. The most obvious thing is the inclusion of volumetric clouds and tweaks to things like shadow resolution, but even this isn't especially straightforward. Remember those reflective puddles I mentioned earlier? Well, on PlayStation 5, both fidelity and performance mode feature these reflective puddles and surfaces when it rains. On Xbox Series X, only the fidelity mode offers reflective puddles, and on Xbox Series S, it's much the same as Series X. Keep this in mind for later. Now, PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X both seem to operate with similar resolution metrics as well. Both fidelity and performance mode seem to hang around 1800p, but there is evidence that dynamic resolution scaling can occur. The thing is, 9 times out of 10, the pixel counts always came back with a 50 out of 60 count sample, suggesting that it doesn't really scale that often and perhaps could stand to be a little more aggressive in performance mode. Looking very closely though, I do feel that Xbox Series X has a slight overall resolution advantage. It's just ever so slightly sharper. Series S, however, sits with the fidelity mode coming in around 1440p, while performance mode is in the realm of 1080p instead. Honestly though, image quality and pixel counts are ultimately unimportant in this case. Image quality isn't really an issue here, and it looks clean enough on all three machines. The real problem lies in performance, which I'd like to discuss here before moving on to last generation consoles and the Nintendo Switch. So let's start with Xbox Series X. I start with this one because frankly, it's the only version that's close to being solid. 
much of the experience of driving around Liberty City can be enjoyed at 60 frames per second in performance mode, and it feels pretty good when this happens. The problem is the frame rate can take a dive when the action heats up. The lowest points can hit under 40 frames per second even, which is quite simply unacceptable in my book. And that's ultimately the real issue here. The frame rate just isn't stable when it counts. Anytime you jump into the action or things start to get a little busy, the frame rate drops. VRR can help to some degree, but even this isn't enough to fully eliminate the sensation of judder. It's gonna happen no matter what, and it's not good. That a console as powerful as the Xbox Series X can struggle to hit 60 in a game that looks like this is honestly baffling. So what about the fidelity mode then? Well, this one does hit its target just fine. The problem is it exhibits frame pacing errors at random, ruining whatever consistency you may have hoped for. When I sampled this myself, I honestly just had to set the controller down and go do something else for a while. It's just ridiculous at this point. But unfortunately, it gets worse. So PlayStation 5, performance mode suggests that it runs worse than the Xbox Series X, and that's true. The frame rate is less consistent. Then I went back to gather more frame rate analysis footage during the day and found that it was actually reasonably stable, leading me to run some tests. And that's when it dawned on me. The PS5 version, when using performance mode, seems to retain visual features that were intended to be used in fidelity mode. That means reflections on wet surfaces and the improved cloud rendering both seem to remain active when using performance mode on PS5, and it has dire consequences when it comes to frame rate. Remember on Xbox when using the performance mode, the sky rendering and reflections are handled differently compared to the fidelity mode. So it's almost like performance mode seems to be roughly the same as fidelity mode, but with the frame rate cap removed. As a result, performance mode on PS5 is not smooth enough in my experience. I certainly can't recommend it. Again though, that's not to say that dips like this don't also occur on the Xbox Series X, it's just that they're more frequent on PS5, and I really think it comes down to this setting situation. Fidelity mode is, of course, just like Xbox Series X though. It hits the cap, but the frame pacing issues again interrupt fluidity, so it never feels especially nice. But then again, the performance mode is so lousy that you're kind of better off using this in the end. But if you purchased this darn game on PlayStation and would prefer smooth performance, I have a tip just for you. Download the PlayStation 4 version. Yes, it's a separate application, and if you play it on PS5, you can enjoy the PS4 Pro version in performance mode at a nearly flawless 60 frames per second. It is in fact the only way to hit a consistent frame rate target on any of the consoles. But there's a huge caveat here. It's the PS4 Pro version, which means there's a massive cut to the resolution, down to 864p most of the time, and there's a loss in some of the visual quality elsewhere, so you don't get reflections or volumetric clouds. Honestly, though, there's really no other way to enjoy the game this smoothly on a PS5, so I kind of recommend downloading the PS4 version and suffering through the low resolution, and enjoy your frames. Next up, Xbox Series S. I'm sure you can guess at this point, the performance mode is not smooth. In fact, it's mostly similar to the PS5's native performance mode, just at 1080p instead of 1800p and without the extra visual effects, but it actually kind of gets worse. In fact, there's even sequences where we saw dips below 30 frames per second. I'm really not entirely sure what's going on here, it's just not great. VRR can partially mitigate the issue, but again, the drops are severe enough that it does not save the day, so don't rely on it. Quality mode suffers the same fate as the other versions as well, which means you get incorrect frame pacing in random spurts. The thing is though, given what we saw in performance mode, it's also possible that it could dip below 30 as well. So that's basically the gist on current generation consoles. Xbox Series X is probably the best bet if you insist on playing this, as it's the only one that offers near 4K visuals at mostly, but not always, 60 frames per second. The smoothest version, though, is of course the PS4 Pro version running on a PS5, but you give up a lot of pixels to get there. Everything else is just not good enough in my opinion. Speaking of not good enough, let's talk about Nintendo Switch.
I gotta admit, after seeing Dying Light running on a Switch, especially after the patch which fixes the frame rate issues, you kinda start expecting something decent when dealing with a game like this, but as you may have guessed, you're not gonna be getting that this time. So for starters, docked mode. The game seems to average around 648p or thereabouts. It's low resolution, but also kind of expected I'd say for an Unreal Engine 4 game. It's of course lower in portable mode as well, naturally. But that's not really the issue here. It's the visual changes that stick out the most. Firstly, ambient occlusion, while somewhat ugly on the newer consoles, does at least help ground objects in the world. With this feature absent on Switch though, you're given the impression that objects and cars kind of just float in the scene. It looks absolutely atrocious. It's honestly unbelievable at times. And yeah, obviously PlayStation 2 did not have ambient occlusion, but that still manages to look more natural, I think. It's also missing some of the more advanced effects like reflections, of course, as well as the post-processing like motion blur, higher quality cloud rendering, and more. It's basically blurry and lacking in detail. But again, this wouldn't even be that big of a deal if it actually ran okay, but it doesn't. And fundamentally, that's what really ruins this version of the game. It's capped at 30 frames per second, of course, and has the same frame pacing issues as the other version, but it also drops a lot. Take a look at the frame time graph here on the left and you can kind of see what I mean. It's just this constant delivery of inconsistent frames that ruins the overall fluidity of the game. It never feels great. In fact, in some ways I would argue that this runs and feels worse than the PlayStation 2 version, which didn't run great to begin with. I mean, when you see games like Dying Light or The Witcher 3 humming along on the Switch, this just winds up feeling even less acceptable in my opinion. It's really a big mess. Honestly, performance is slightly worse in portable mode, where the resolution hovers just above 480p most of the time. It honestly feels pretty bad to play. It was not great in docked mode, but here it's just constantly dipping under 30 and feels very, very unstable. There's really no getting around this one. And honestly, we haven't even touched on things like traffic density or the reduced draw distance, all of which contribute to the Switch version looking and playing very poorly. This is not a good Switch conversion. It is at least worth noting though that shadow maps are present, as are some of the dynamic shadows from headlights, so it's not as if every feature has been disabled, but still, the Switch version overall is just sort of muddy, ugly, and choppy. It's not a good version. I cannot stress that enough. But enough about the Nintendo Switch. What about those last gen consoles? We can't leave those out, can we? Well, firstly, there's the Xbox One and Xbox One X. The average resolution here on Xbox One X is around 1728p, while the base Xbox One hangs more around 864p. There is evidence of DRS going below this, but by and large, you can expect four times the pixels on Xbox One X. Now, there are no visual modes on these consoles, and things such as the improved volumetric cloud rendering and the reflections available during the rain are not present in either version. In fact, it basically looks the same. The only difference is the pixel count. It does, however, make for an interesting comparison when it comes to performance. For reasons unknown, the developer has opted to leave the frame rate completely uncapped on both machines. So on Xbox One X, there's really no hope of reaching 60 frames per second, but it does at least hang out in the mid 40s. Now again, this feels kind of absurd considering the visuals, but there it is. Now the frame rate can go both above and below 45 FPS, but this is roughly where it will sit. Anyone that has followed Digital Foundry over the years will likely know that we don't much care for these unstable uncapped frame rates, but in this case, it's hard to say whether 30 FPS with incorrect frame pacing would be that much better, to be honest. Xbox One S, though, is even more fascinating. Now, we know that it typically renders just one quarter of the pixels as Xbox One X, yet its performance is noticeably worse. While its bigger brother hangs around 45 frames per second most of the time, Xbox One S is almost always below 40, leading to an even less stable experience. In fact, in busy scenes, it can also dip below 30 frames per second. This is with visual quality comparable to the other console's performance modes, really, but with lower average performance. 
Ultimately, neither Xbox One version of the game is very good, though they both sit well above the Nintendo Switch version. Unstable frame rates and a lack of visual features are the primary issue here. So that leaves just two more consoles, the PlayStation 4 and the PlayStation 4 Professional. Well, let's start with the base PS4. This one's interesting. This version actually does feature the water reflections and puddles in the rain, which are absent from Xbox One, but its general resolution and overall visual quality is somewhat comparable otherwise. Both are in that 864p range, though Xbox One S can exhibit additional blurring I found. The primary difference here lies in the frame rate. On PlayStation 4, the developers have capped it at 30fps, so you get that same 30fps cap with inconsistent frame pacing, as we've seen in the quality mode on other versions, but it winds up feeling more consistent than Xbox One S, where the frame rate is just kind of all over the place. Neither are optimal, but that's basically what you can expect here. PS4 Pro, then, has the honor of being the final console covered in this video, and this one features both a fidelity and a performance mode, which is kind of unexpected since none of the other current generation versions have this option. That means in fidelity mode you do get the water reflections and other improvements, but you do not get the volumetric clouds. Performance mode loses these visual features expectedly. Both modes tend to sit below 1080p, but performance mode is definitely blurrier with counts generally coming in around 864p. The thing is, it all feels somewhat underutilized because you would kind of expect the PS4 Pro in quality mode at least to sort of outperform the base PlayStation 4, but it's actually very, very similar. So how about the frame rate? Well, when examining the results, they're kind of what you might expect by this point. I think you can predict it. Fidelity mode has a 30 FPS cap with the same incorrect frame pacing we've seen many times now, while performance mode aims higher yet ultimately falls on its face with these wildly unstable levels of performance. Actually, it's kind of worse than you might expect really. If you look at the fidelity side here, we actually see drops below 30 frames per second, which considering the low resolution of the game is kind of shocking to be honest. Though at this point you would think I'd be pretty used to such surprises when talking about this game. But these two modes make for permutation 12 and 13 respectively, and marks the end of our frame rate discussion section, because by now I'd imagine your eyes have glossed over with visions of improperly paced frames dancing through your head. My conclusions from earlier really don't change. The only versions that run reasonably okay most of the time are Xbox Series X in performance mode and the PS4 Pro version running on a PS5, also in performance mode. So I had to know, what does the mastermind behind Digital Foundry think of this? Which version do you recommend, Richard? No. I concur. But there's one last thing to mention very, very briefly here before we leave the performance section, and that's the loading times. And again, this is extremely predictable. Essentially, when you first boot the game, you have a loading screen. It's a lot faster on the consoles with the SSDs, slower with those that don't have them. That's about it. But I think now it's time to move on to our final section and begin to wrap up all this craziness. If you've been following the discourse around this game, then you've probably heard that it's a tad buggy. And unfortunately, that seems to be the case. During my time with the game, I ran into numerous issues that were both comical and disappointing. These issues range from small problems like shadow rendering bugs. Check out the shadow cast from this truck and you'll see what I mean, it's not drawn correctly. Or the improperly applied clutter textures like these leaves here which just sort of float over the scenery unrealistically. I'd also say that things like the SSR usage can look pretty bad at times, though that's just kind of inherent in the technique. Then there's medium bugs, like this fence collision issue, where the fence texture does not match the collision mesh, allowing the player to clip through the object, but still ultimately find themselves barred from continuing. Also, when you die, at least on Switch, you sometimes get these single-frame glitches of your main character clipping through the ground. 
There's also things like presentation issues, such as the mission titles. In the original, these appear in the lower right corner of the screen, then fade out when you trigger a mission, you know, during the cutscene. In the definitive version, however, they're placed in the center of the screen and often linger there for a lot longer than you'd want ideally. It ends up looking rather awkward. Or the way the camera stutters badly when changing angles while riding the L train around the city. It just feels sloppy. But then there's more serious issues like this. Parts of the map entirely lack collision data and you can fall right down through the world. The funny part is that if you hit it just right, you can wind up bypassing the barrier that blocks you from visiting the second and third islands. I did this from a fresh save here and yeah, you can drive right down into the tunnels and make your way over to the third island. Especially nice if you want to play around with the dodo earlier in the game while scoping out some nasty lods on the Switch here. Basically my point is, is that even if you're just playing the game normally, there's a good chance you're going to run into some faults like this. Then there's other stuff, like I mentioned how the running lights don't work, but the same is true of the backup lights, and there's still issues with the game's physics when running in the higher frame rate modes, plus I found the police to be extra aggressive in this new version. Honestly though, it kind of feels like they probably just started from a very difficult position. I mean, this is an Unreal Engine 4 conversion that was done from the mobile version, which was ported from some other version, which is all different from that original PlayStation 2 version. There's just so many things that could go wrong along the way, and, well, they seemingly have gone wrong. They did at least attempt to freshen up some of the controls by adding a proper right stick camera and things like free aim, but the problem here is that, aside from that camera, most of these changes really still don't gel well with the original mission design or the AI, and it winds up feeling even sillier. It feels like an overhaul that was in progress, but was never fully completed. They also removed some of the camera options from the game, such as the overhead view and the cinematic angle, but that's not a huge loss, all things considered. Honestly though, I could probably talk on this for a while, but I feel like you get the gist by now. The point is, there's issues with this port that make it feel sloppy and unfinished. And that's a shame too, because it's a fascinating time capsule of a game. Grand Theft Auto 3 is the granddaddy of modern open world games, but it kind of reminded me why it worked so well back in the day. Liberty City itself is a relatively small place, all things considered, which makes traversal less of a time sink. Plus, actually just driving around the city is fun. The missions themselves are all very basic by today's standards, without the complex scripting you'd see later in the series, but it grants a certain level of freedom in how you complete them that feels refreshing. You're basically handed a simple objective, the potential to pick up some tools, and then you're left to figure it out on your own. How you accomplish it is up to you. It feels pure in that sense. It's a game that doesn't railroad you into doing things a specific way. Sure, many of those ways feel rather dated today, but it's an important game and one that I still think is worth examining today. And examining is exactly what I think I've done here today. I may not have found all of the issues that people have run into, but this is basically my take on this release. It's really difficult to say whether or not it can be rescued at this point, but I sure hope so. But with that, we've reached the end of the video, so if you did enjoy it, as always, be sure to like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell, and we'll see you next time.